is Startup's Guide uh, to Government Relations and, and uh, allowing government, government in to be a, a catalyst to what we're doing here in Colorado. So I'm going to go ahead and let each um, uh, panelist introduce themselves uh, and exactly from uh, their perspective over the course of the last year, um, some critical elements that, they, that they've overcome. And then we'll kind of open it up and have a nice discussion uh, to really understand how government can be a partner in everything we're building here in the startup community. So welcome. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Veronica Juarez. I am the Director of Government Relations for Lyft. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've actually, I've worked in politics for a decade. Um, I had never worked for a private company. So Lyft is the first uh, private company that I chose to kind of uh, <laughs> work for, and it's been quite a wild ride. Um, when I joined 16 months ago, I was our first government relations hire. We had 60 people um, in the entire company. Now we have about 400 and our government relations team is 20 folks. I'm sure that your team is much larger, but <laughs> it's, been, um, it's been an amazing amount of growth. So just a little bit about our, our um, path here in Colorado. I think, I think one of the first things you have to do whenever you're approaching you know, a new idea and you're looking at rules that have been there for quite some time, um, for an industry that has been historically overregulated, um, is really finding those key champions um, in the state legislator, in elected office, um, in the local community that can help marshal you through that process um, and can support you as you kind of uh, look for new ways to approach a, approach an old problem in a, in a different way. So um, Colorado has been really good for us, and it was fairly easy for us to find those champions. Um, and so I think that's just, you know, a testament to, uh, to the state's commitment to finding new ways to solve um, old problems. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Will McCollum, and I'm the general manager for Uber here in Colorado. I've been with the company for over two years now, and I was one of the original folks who launched the market here. Um, September 5th, two years ago, was our official launch date. Actually, it's it showing on a block away, and I, I know <laughs> there's some familiar faces that were there that night. And um, It's been one hell of a wild ride. I can definitely assert as well. Um, very, very much so humble beginnings. You know, At that time, our office was above Pinche Tacos and Okinawa Sushi over on Colfax, and it was a very hot summer. And the thing I remember most is that it was hot and it was very smelly, and so we, we really were a startup back then. Um, but then as well, as, as the company began to grow and the, the product began to, to really take off, we attracted the attention of the local regulators. And so back then, it was me and Travis and Sally Yu. That was the policy team, basically. Um, we didn't have a policy team. And we quickly found out that we needed to start taking on some of these challenges in a bit more of a thoughtful manner and a thoughtful approach. But I think that for the most part, when you've got a product that people genuinely like, that they can rely on, that adds value to their lives, when you've got a product that creates opportunity and it creates entrepreneur, it just unleashes this entrepreneurship in, in so many drivers, it's not a hard sell to regulators, to legislators with vision and folks who want to be on the right side of history. It's, it's really not a hard sell. And I think that that's ultimately what got us through the Uber Black battle um, in our first year, and then as well the UberX legislation, which Dan was so integral to, um, and then as well our, our um, colleagues in this, in this situation over at Lyft. You know? um, so for the most part, it's been one hell of a wild ride. The company keeps growing, the company keeps getting bigger, but it's important to kind of reflect and, and take Startup Week to realize that we do have those startup roots, um, and that's why I'm just so pleased to be here. Well, it's great to be with you this afternoon. My name is Dan Pabone, uh, representative of, of House District 4, which is in North and West Denver. Uh, for those of you who are Colorado natives, and for those of you who are not, that's the Highlands area and Sloan's Lake, um, and kind of everywhere in between. And this is such a great uh, day and a great event to be part of. I'm just proud to be uh, play a small role in that. Uh, you know, when I was first, uh, just to kind of give you my background, uh, when I first started out, I was actually a mechanical engineer. Uh, graduated uh, from uh, CU Boulder and wanted to go and work for a, a software company. And there was a startup software company that was doing uh, bioimaging and biomedical research um, here in Colorado. And so I was part of a small team 
of, of you know, 20 somethings who were trying to roll out this product as quickly as we could without any real beta testing, sort of doing on, online, uh, real time sort of testing and, and rolling out. So it feels good to be back to my roots um, in this. I've since obviously gotten way off track and I'm in the legislature, so you have to forgive my poor decisions since then. But at some point, I was on the right track. Um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about in, in just the background to the companies is, um, you know, when we were first thinking about, you know, how do we bring these companies to Colorado and how do we make sure that these companies are welcomed here? Uh, I, I started with the drivers and, and, you know, how many people have actually used Uber or Lyft? Raise your hand in this room. So you know that the, 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 the experience is, is pretty unique and, and the, the drivers are, are a pretty amazing bunch of people, right? And what really struck me was a conversation I was having uh, with, a, with a woman um, who was in a Lyft car. And one, it's just you know, surprising to see a, a woman driving you know, in a ride-sharing vehicle or in a, definitely never a cab. But, so I asked her, how, you know, how did you find this job? And she said, well, you know, I'm a caretaker for my child. Um, I'm his CNA. He's, on a, he's an autistic. And um, he's in school uh, a couple hours a day. But this was one of the few jobs that I could find that allowed me to send my child to school but still have the flexibility to earn some money and you know, didn't have to ask my boss when I, was, uh, when I could get off and, and try to arrange a, a really tough schedule. So I signed up and have been doing this ever since. And I said, well, that's, that's an amazing you know, story. I'm so glad you found this. But, but how did you find Lyft? I mean, there's, there's got to be um, you know, some other connection you had. She said, well, there's actually a Lyft serve of autistic parents in San Francisco um, who shared this opportunity with all of us. And so it's just sort of a different perspective on the ride sharing economy and the ride sharing um, opportunities that we have. And after that, of course, I was sold on that story alone to, to run the legislation and to make sure that these companies were here. Obviously, it's a con we're, for, we're for the consumers first, but to hear the ripple effects that these companies are having in the state of Colorado was just too powerful. So that's my intro into the session. Thanks, Dan, very much. Well, I think it'd be interesting to start off. Um, there was an article, I think, believe in Inc. Magazine uh, just last week talking about um, Airbnb. It talked a lot about Uber. And it said the real innovation in these tech companies is not the technology. The innovation is actually the policy and legislation of moving forward decisions in a public in a, in a public forum to allow these applications to actually work in those cities. Um, well, what, what were some of your tips and tricks um, uh, in making that successful? Because the first interaction I had with uh, Travis, um, I think he uh, had some kind remarks for the governor at an Aspen Ideas Fest, pretty much saying Colorado wasn't open for innovation. And, th and uh, from that point forward, you guys successfully were able to, to navigate and kind of pull things together to, to pass not one but two bills. Yeah, so I, I remember the, those comments quite <laughs> distinctly, actually. Um, but, you know, we've, we've changed as a company since then. You know, back then, Uber wasn't a, a sure thing. I mean, our survival here in Colorado was very much so up in the air. We were the 15th market to be launched with Uber. And at that time, we'd only lost one regulatory battle, which was in, in Vancouver. And to this day, that's the only regulatory um, battle that we've lost where we actually had to pull out of a market. So we're very proud of our track record. But back then... You know, th there wasn't a stamp of, of approval. There was no guarantee that, hey, this Uber thing is really a good idea. This Uber thing is really going to work. You know, since we're, we're in over 200 cities and 45 countries or something like that. And so a lot of the regulatory issues that we were having here two years ago, now we're having in a lot of other states where, where Uber just isn't yet, uh, yet, or we're having them in different countries as well. But, you know, back then, Travis was, was, he was aggressive. And, and we like to use the word fierce. We believe in our product, and we see every day, you know, these driver stories, especially Dan's anecdote here, I mean, these are very genuine stories, and that's why we get up in the morning, because we know that we're creating real opportunity. These are real jobs, and we are changing people's lives. And so when you have the ability, you know, for, for me, Startup Week isn't about just tech startups over at Galvanize or Industry or, like, the Ivory Tower programming developer jobs, but every single driver that works with us is an entrepreneur. Every single one of them somehow scrapes together that money to buy a car to, to unleash their own entrepreneurism. So I think that those, those comments and that fierceness that Travis channeled 
comes from a very genuine desire to defend that innovation, to defend that opportunity. And I think that now legislators and regulators are getting on board with, with that vision because it's ultimately proven time and time again, and Colorado was, was ground zero for this, that it is the right way forward and you want to be on the right side of history. And so um, hopefully we've softened our tone a little bit since then, but that's where that came from is, is that word fierce. Uh, Dan, um, you're one of the most progressive technologists, elected officials that are out there. I mean, I think you've identified both innovation after innovation in, this, in the city and helped to create a dialogue within the legislature around that. Um, what do you have, what type of recommendations or, or tips and tricks do you have for the audience as it relates to, if you have that innovative idea, knowing that technology and innovation often moves at much faster pace than the government process and legislation. Um, what recommendations do you have to engage with you and others to be able to kind of bring those uh, speeds together? Well, I think um, for those of you who are in this room, you should recognize that you're probably in the top one half of 1% of Coloradoans or, or uh, people in this building because you're actually taking an opportunity to engage, uh, to learn more about how you actually interact with your elected officials. Most people, as you know, don't do this. Um, you know, there's people who are working two jobs, trying to foot, put food on the table, trying to pay for college, childcare, um, and a whole host of other issues. And so as much as we like to think um, that, you know, we are uh, connected to our constituents and connected to the issues uh, in Colorado, it really uh, is incumbent upon you as entrepreneurs and innovators to let us know two things. One, what you're doing. Uh, we love to see new ideas. We love to see new inventions and new things before everyone else, right? We're just like anyone else. Um, but two, we also want to know where do you live and what do you care about? We care about our constituents. You know, I have a, a system in my office. Um, as you might imagine, we get calls and emails and, and uh, text messages all the time. And every time that I see a message from a constituent, it bumps to the top. It's an automatic system that we have in place because the people who we represent are our most important allies, right? You're the ones who, you know, are sometimes elected us. Hopefully every, everyone here registered to vote. Raise your hand. Okay. Some folks I see not registered to vote. <laughs> we'll catch you after this. Um, <laughs> But obviously, participating in this electoral democracy is, is so critical. And, you know, to show up, two things, right? Showing up at a legislator's office is unheard of, probably maybe for you, but it's actually unheard of for us, too. We don't get enough people um, who are what I would call the normal people um, come and visit us. Um, seriously, we get a lot of interest, um, special interest primarily, um, lobbyists. Um, and folks who want something from us. We don't necessarily hear from our constituents who don't necessarily want something, but they just want us to know what you're doing. And I think that's, that's where you kind of separate um, the entrepreneurs and the innovators from everyone else. Because frankly, the best thing we can do for you, as we, many of us know, is stay out of the way. Um, not over-regulate, not introduce you know, legislation that's going to stifle the creativity or the entrepreneurship, but simply to, to allow you to do what you do best and allow us to do what we do best. Um, you know, at the heart of things, I think we're all problem solvers in the legislature. It may not seem that way all the time, especially if you look at places like Congress, but the Colorado legislature is a little bit different. Um, we, we truly do um, try to take each issue on um, in a nonpartisan uh, way to, to make sure that we do have um, this, this economic opportunity and this platform for all of you. So I think, you know, reaching out to your state legislator, um, everyone know who their state legislator is? There's, there's an app out um, called Politico. I just downloaded it. Uh, is John Butler in the room? Uh, it's a quick plug. Um, that you can actually search um, who your state legislator is um, in Colorado, and you can email them and call them right from that app, um, and it's something you should all utilize here today, um, if not just an introduc introductory line to say hello. Um, and then secondly, of course, um, working with people like the Colorado Technology Association, 
uh, to espouse your views when legislation comes up or you think you might want to see legislation as Uber and Lyft did. It was kind of nice to be proactive and work with the technology companies um, that we've done now many times um, to actually get something done. Um, and honestly, it's as simple as saying, I think this is a good idea, and a legislature saying, I think so too. Let's work together on that. Um, so I guess those were a couple of ideas I have there. Thanks, Dan. Um, last year at this time, uh, I remember um, Lyft celebrating its launch. I remember, I think it was like the Tuesday or Wednesday of Denver Startup Week. Um, we had a grand opening and kind of in this space um, announced alongside of you guys uh, the launch of the Denver market. Um, how has collaboration been key in the year since? And then uh, how did you quickly get involved in the discussion being the, the, the newest entrant into the market in the last 12 months? I think so it's been integral. Being able to partner with folks locally is, is absolutely integral to, I think, your long-term success. Um, one of the things that works extremely well, I think, for both Uber and Lyft is, is the high consumer demand for the product. So once people use it, they love it, they want to use it again. Um, there's also this huge economic empowerment piece that we keep touching on, which is uh, which is just central to you know Lyft's ethos and and our commitment to continue to empower folks in the community. So, by virtue of the fact that that's a part of the the fabric of our company, um, I think it it makes it really easy for us to continue to integrate. Um, we're extremely happy to to be here and to be back. I remember we were talking about our launch, and then we got wind that this was happening around the same time, so we kind of hurried to be able to, to announce um, at base camp. And honestly, at this point, you know, we have a really interesting new challenge as a company, and that's to learn how to now be, a, um, I don't know if my comms team is gonna like how I say this, um, how to be a very mature actor. Um, so we, you know, have enjoyed this enormous amount of growth. We have launched in 70 cities. Um, and we have enjoyed uh, you know, this incredible consumer demand, but how do we now learn how to be a really mature actor, um, both in the community and continued you know, with uh, our champions and with the elected officials and all of, the, all of those good things. So that's what we are, are now challenged in learning how to do very well. What, what do each of you see coming next? I feel like some of these issues, they come up really fast and they get really big really quick. Um, in, in the world, whether it's specifically ride sharing or whether it's you know, car services or even things as we're talking about like with Airbnb or other sort of like shared economy-like innovations. Um, one, what innovations do you see coming? And two, um, what, what, what elements do you have in your time, like on your horizon from a political perspective that you see that might cause companies like yours and others problems in the future in Colorado? Um, I can go ahead and field first. Um, so one of the biggest things for me, I think Senate Bill 125 was one hell of an achievement, and it was a landmark piece of legislature because it was the first one of its kind, right? So Colorado steps up to the plate. We're the first one to recognize UberX as a transportation network company, first, first of its kind in the nation. And that was very much so worthy of being celebrated, but from our perspective, it was a mandate. I mean, that was just the beginning, right? So now that we've got this piece of legislation in place, we've got to live up to it. And that really changed the paradigm of how Uber interacts with the Public Utilities Commission, for example, which is the state regulator um, for taxis, for luxury limousines, and now this new vehicle class. So it's kind of a be careful what you, you wish for because you just might get it situation. It's not necessarily just that the legislation said you got to do background checks or you got to do medical checks or you got to do vehicle inspections. It was the right thing to do in the first place. And so from our perspective, the world is watching and our adversaries are watching and waiting for us to trip up. And so taking that piece of legislation and then actually living up to its mandate has been our primary focus this entire summer. So when it comes to a medical check, every single driver on the road that's with, with Uber or UberX has their federal DOT medical card. They've all had their vehicles inspected. They've all had their background checks and that's something that we can't mess around with because that ends up on the front page of the, of the WSJ. And that's not only about the faith that the, legislation, that the legislature and the governor have put into to these new products. That's not only about our business model, it's about the state too and our reputation, reputation as an innovator. And so you gotta live up to it. And so from my point of view, you know, what trends do I see coming in tech and innovation? 
et cetera. For me, it's one thing to get these laws written. It's one thing to get passed. But then if you're an Airbnb or a Lyft or an UberX, we got to live up to those mandates. And so that's what I see being the huge push is we got to prove that this really works. Yeah, I'd love to add on. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say. Oh, okay. I'd love to add on to that. Um, so we did, you know, go through this le legislative process at the state. Now there is a rulemaking process at the PUC. And then in, in Denver specifically, for hire vehicles are also regulated by the city. So I say all of that to say I think there tends to be, and knowing that my entire background, my entire career has been in government, so I'm not anti-government, um, but there, there is sometimes this, this um, almost desire or need from government to continue to regulate something so that you get to a point where we look at existing industry and you look at you know, cabs and you know, regular for hire vehicles that have traditionally been just over-regulated. So I think one of the, the really kind of nuanced, interesting things we need to be careful of is that we do not continue to now regulate you know, this new industry and an innovative solution to the point where it then becomes the next cab or it then becomes the next you know kind of black car service maybe there is a different way to achieve the same public safety goals um, but just without three layers of that regulation um, maybe you can still achieve that goal you know with one layer um, so that's going to be a very interesting conversation we have now because now that I think and this is happening in cities and states everywhere I'm not picking on Colorado by any means. Um, but once they see one level of regulation happen, it's the next government agency or entity says, okay, now it's our turn. Now what can we do about getting involved and where do we fit in? Um, and that, those kinds of processes do not encourage further innovation. It makes it hard for companies con to continue to innovate. We are you know, continually experimenting with new products. In San Francisco, we just launched a lift line, which aggregates um, folks based on origin and destination. So whereas you know, two people would take two separate lifts, now, they're one, now two people are taking one lift going along the same route. We would love to continue, innovate way, to continue to innovate ways to take more vehicles off the road, to share those empty seats, but that becomes harder and harder if you constantly have agencies wanting to regulate you even more. So I think, um, I think that has to be kind of carefully thought about and considered, honestly, from this point forward. Representative Pabone, um, we've had some of these talks, uh, you, you know, throughout the session this year. But uh, around innovation, things continue to get more complex. You know, technology five years ago, you were talking about let's make a decision to put a piece of fiber or cable in the ground, and you know, what are the impediments of doing that? Today, you're talking about privacy. You're talking about the safety of our children. You're talking about consumer uh, laws. You're talking about the actual innovation itself. Um, what do you do to stay on top of this um, and just be an, an, you know, an invested um, elected official? And what can entrepreneurs do to keep you and others educated so they can you know, move forward the dialogue at a pace that's you know, faster than trying to do that on your own? Well, I think I, I want to go back to your last question because I think it ties into this one. I think one of the biggest things you're seeing right now is sort of the next issue aside from ride sharing and, and home sharing and all those other uh, uh, shared economy uh, movements is the expansion of broadband. Um, there are still places um, in Colorado uh, that have no access to the internet. Uh, there are still folks uh, who live in this city and nearby who don't have a computer at their home. And I think one of the things that we need to address as uh, you know, the Colorado State Legislature um, and, and on is making sure that we provide access to everyone because it's the, it's the tide that lifts all boats, right? If, if you're entrepreneurs and you have an app that's gonna help a particular consumer or, or a particular area uh, of industry and there, there's no access to downloading that app or having a smartphone, then obviously that, that uh, prohibits, uh, that's a marketplace that you can't even reach. So I think we're seeing this just like we saw electricity lines and just like we saw um, you know, transportation connections, that we need to expand this. And there's some entrenchment here. Uh, make no mistake, the, you know, the folks who are involved with landlines are still trying to hold on to that, that vestige and uh, prohibiting us from expanding broadband to a certain degree. So 
you know, there's always going to be those who want to keep things the way they are and those who want to expand, and we've got to work to find that, that right balance. Um, so I would say that, you know, with, with all technology, there's both, you know, the positives and then there's the unintended consequences. You know, the exposure of, of young people to things on the internet that they may not otherwise be exposed to. Um, if, if, you're, if you've seen sort of, you know, uh, most recently what happened to, you know, Jennifer Lawrence and others who had their phones hacked and had pictures displayed, um, you know, without their consent, um, that's actually a law that we addressed this last year. Um, it, it's, a, it's a revenge porn um, criminal legislation that we put into place this year to address that very behavior. So part of it is sort of seeing what's coming down on the horizon yeah. and making sure that we, we, those who engage in criminal acts are punished and we send a signal to the rest of, of society that that kind of behavior is not gonna be tolerated. But at the same time, we had to work through with the telecom providers and, and everyone else to make sure that we crafted that law specifically and directly so it didn't upset the apple cart in any way from a technology point of view. So I think the issue here, um, the advice I would give to my colleagues is if you've got an idea in the technology space, uh, you need to reach out to the experts. You need to reach out to the entrepreneurs and the innovators, but you also need to reach out to the folks who are providing the actual broadband or the, the bandwidth to be able to do this. And when you can, I think under, I mean, this technology is so complex and I don't think anyone here, um, you know, aside from their own narrow sliver of, of knowledge, which is, can be very powerful, has the big picture uh, of this, which is why we rely on, on our friends, um, again, at the Techno Colorado Technology Association to help us fill in those blanks. Um, but I think it's also, again, looking at it from the consumer side, you know, do we have access um, and do we have you know, public safety protections. I think that's the core role of, of government. And once we have those in place, I think, it, you know, we can continue to let the innovators innovate. Well, it's so awesome to all three up here. I think especially the year with Uber and Lyft. Um, congratulations. It's really awesome to know that I, I, I t tell everybody when I talk in the context of legislation, I talk about the broadband package, all five bills that we passed this year to modernize our, our telecom infrastructure in the state of Colorado. And right behind it, I talk about the Colorado solution. And I think it's, a, it's an innovation that puts a face on the fact that our legislation, legislators are progressive. They understand our constituents. They are working with companies to move Colorado forward. And I'm just really excited at all your work and all your lobbyists work and your team's work to make it because you're really moving the state forward. And thank you very, very much. Um, I'd love to open up some questions and then uh, think about some closing comments of th you can leave them with in terms of how to be successful working with you. Um, do, do I have some questions from the crowd? Yes, in the back. Um, let's see, do we have a walking mic or? Just shout it out, shout it. This is startup week. Oh, here it comes. Here's the walking mic. Please introduce yourself and then ask the question. All right. Uh, my name is Scott. I run a company called StatusPage.io. Uh, um, so Colorado recently went up against the federal government with a Schedule One substance to say, hey, we as a state believe that this should be legal. Um, a good analog right now is people that are working with uh, commercial drones where the FAA has repeatedly said, we're going to charge you money, we're going to fine you, this is not legal. But we've still yet to see a state go up against a big federal agency like the FAA. So I don't know if you can talk specifically into how this legislation played out, where you basically passed it and said, if you want to come try and have this battle, then let's do it, because we as a state feel like we should get to make these laws. Uh, and if there's anything in sort of an analogous territory, it'd be good to hear about as well. Um, so uh, you're referring to Amendment 64 and sort of what the Colorado voters decided to, you know, basically legalize something that otherwise would be illegal under the Federal um, Substance uh, Control Act. Um, you know, I, honestly, I mean, I think this is a good point. I mean, that wasn't the Colorado legislature, um, if you think about it. That was a vote of, of all of you. Um, and, um, you know, it passed with 55% uh, of the vote. So I won't ask who voted for it or, you know, who's using it right now. But there's a good chance that more than half of this room voted for it and, and maybe using it. I don't know. Uh, but, but, that was a grassroots movement. I mean, it, it literally was a group of people uh, smaller than this room who started that, that notion. And so 
just from a just from a bigger picture point of view about trying to do something in Colorado when the legislature or others might not be interested in moving along those policy lines, we have one of the easiest initiative process in the country um, to do that. So that that's that's part one. I guess part two is um, you know I just saw something come across uh, my email today um, where the states are taking a strong stance against preemption um, by the F I think it's the FCC to prohibit um, states from actually entering into uh, is it the bro the broadband space where they can self fund um, broadband expansion yeah, um, by municipal by municipalities yeah. and and whatnot and so the states have come out just today and pushed back against that strongly uh, to say you know let each state decide. Uh, for themselves what's the best policy for that type of expansion. So it's happening as we speak, um, and I think you know, you're going to see more and more of these issues as we keep going. A quick, just a quick follow-up. As, as an entrepreneur in Colorado, I, to more direct question would be, what sort of protections would we expect from the state of Colorado? Like, what sort of going to bat is the state going to do for us if we were to get a ballot initiative or something were to pass and, and we get this sort of, um, we get this encroachment by the federal government. You know, assuming that the uh, Department of Justice did decide to go through and start enforcing the Scheduled Substance uh, Abuse Act, I guess it was, um, you know, what is the role of the state of Colorado in that? Um, I'm, I'm more so looking for entrepreneurs that are in sort of a regulated environment to feel like they can uh, start a business, put a bunch of time into it, put a bunch of, a bunch of investment into it, uh, and feel good that the state that they're operating in is going to be a partner in that business? I mean, I think as a practical matter, I don't think there's any state law in place right now that's going to protect the particular activity you're talking about, so, so drone development and, and flying and, and airspace. Um, I, I think, you know, looking forward, what you would need is some sort of potentially um, a proactive piece of legislation that says that the state of Colorado is going to regulate that space and, and take part in it, um, then you would have some protection if the federal m government stepped in. Now, I also am a lawyer and is an, in addition to an engineer, so you know we will. You can hear three different opinions about this, but <laughs> but um, the FAA may be able to step in um, and say you're preempted um, by having this law in the first place. So. You know, it's, it is a, a, a sort of an interesting issue you bring up, but a thorny one. And I think one worth probably, you know, if there's enough entrepreneurs and innovators looking at this issue, I think it's one worth talking about. Next question. Anyone? We have an awesome panel up here that just won some big, big things this year. Grab something out of their brain to take home and make it successful for you. Any other? Abram. Development Center at the Chamber. Um, I wanted to go back to the point you guys made about the state legislation that then gets muddied up by agencies or divisions within municipalities and whatnot. How do we build a voice so that when simple things, excuse me, when we get caught up in that, where I used to use an example about restaurants uh, in Denver. And so if you wanted to get, do a restaurant, you got a liquor license, building department, fire department. How do you build a voice that's steady but fierce? Maybe that's not the supposed to use anymore <laughs> oh and uh, the health department <laughs> yeah you have the health department yeah so I, I've actually spoken to Ash about that exact um, that exact topic you know and, and it, it's a tough situation from a for, from our perspective because what I really want to do on a day-to-day -day basis is focus on getting riders connected with drivers that's at at its core, what we do, but for the last couple of years, what, what I found my, my main job description was, was regulatory certainty, because you have to give the public peace of mind in order for them to want to take rides, and you have to give drivers certainty that if they go out and buy a car, that there's going to be a job, there's going to be a position for them the, the next day to, to actually use that car. Um, and so, in, in terms of, of coalescing one voice, you know, that's, that's something that we as a company have gone from, again, I like, I like the, the maturation um, idea, you know, from going to being kind of this petulant upstart and, you know, hey, we're going to send an email to everybody and get, 
get and tell the media that the sky is falling down to a more thoughtful approach where it really is this mandate from the legislature that the governor has signed into law that ultimately we need to live up to the conditions of this of this legislation and so th there are two things that come to mind one there are market forces at work here clients let us know when a ride doesn't work and I don't want to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and I sure as heck don't want the state of Colorado to be on the front of the Wall Street Journal so there are forces that are way more intimidating than maybe a, a fine or two from from the PUC at work here and they keep us honest. And on that note, the market forces that are at work and the state legislation that is in place that does provide that peace of mind and that clarity for drivers to make investment is successfully being enforced and we're working with the state regulator. And so when it comes to the, the city and county, when it comes to the airport, when it comes to Colorado Springs, Boulder, Fort Collins, now we've got all of these different municipalities with different actors that we need to interact with too. So it's kind of like the restaurant situation where we've got the different departments, except for us, we want to be able to operate on the front range and provide access to UberX across the entire front range and into the high country. So now I've got all these different municipalities to deal with. What, what, I, what I really want to do is just focus on growing the business. And so that's a challenge that we're, we're, we're working through, but I think that just having a more cooperative tone, reaching out to legislators, having these kinds of dialogues. And don't get me wrong, we're gonna compete in the marketplace, <laughs> for real. But on the other hand, this is such a great opportunity for us to work together because we're on the right side of history and this has been a good partnership from the regulatory standpoint. And I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve here together because we can put our differences aside and do what's right for drivers and do what's right for riders. Veronica? Yeah, I'd love to add on to that. Um, well, he said for real. Yeah, so, he did. So, <laughs> so you, we, have to, we have to say something. I mean. um, so I'd love to answer your question. I think that's a great one. Uh, you know, that, I think as we continue to talk about these regulations, it gets, it gets nuanced, right? Um, it's, it's easy to, to read the news and say, great, we have this state regulation passed, we're done. No, actually, there's all these other steps, and then like Will was outlining municipalities and the airport. So I think that it's really the onus is on us to continue to have that open and honest conversation with all of our partners so that you can continue to have that conversation with the folks that we are also, you know, needing to work this out through. Um, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's really a group conversation, right? They're not only hearing from us that, hey, they, this may be just a little too much, um, or let's look at the path we're heading, heading down, um, but rather that that's coming from multiple people, you know, in the city as well. So, you know, and that's, um, you know, you don't want folks to get fatigued around that conversation, right? Especially our consumers, like, hey, we need you to come to battle with us again. It's like, oh gosh, we already did this for, the, for a whole year, you know? Um, so I think, I think quite honestly, we can do a better job of, of engaging um, all of you guys to help us have that conversation. Representative Pavone, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I guess I would say, I mean, I think generally speaking, it's it's easy to point fingers at the regulators or at the bureaucrats and their faceless, nameless, you know, unelected government officials. And and, and I think, you know, to a certain degree, you know, that is true, um, that, that, that we have an education job um, that only starts at the legislature but doesn't end. Um, but I think the, f the folks who I've seen who are most successful in the regulatory round uh, are the ones who have spent the time and energy and effort with those particular agencies and with that not anonymous uh, regulator, but a real person uh, spending time educating them about their particular industry and, and make basically hearing that from all sides. It also requires, of course, leadership from the top. I mean, ultimately, uh, these folks were appointed um, or put into place by someone else, and generally speaking, you know, we're talking about the executive branch um, in the government. And so, you know, our governor John Hickenlooper, um, I think, has done everything he can as far as this appointment process goes to make sure that there's folks who are interested in seeing these companies succeed. What's also happened is that some of these regulators are. Uh, protected by the career service program. So regardless of what they do or what laws they put into place or what rules they choose, they're completely untouchable. You want to have a conversation about that? 
let's do it. But that's a whole, that's a whole bigger thing than, than this uh, Denver Startup Week. So we're getting ready at 3 o'clock to start the uh, Startup Farmers Market. And so I think what we'd love to do, um, one, we encourage all of you to, to attend programming like this in our leadership spotlights throughout the week. Tons more programming. Go to denverstartupweek.com slash base camp and see how things change. But I would like to end, end this panel with um, a couple questions uh, for each of you to kind of rapid fire, make a quick black and white choice, um, and then uh, stick around and let folks uh, um, uh, engage with you here for a little bit as we get inv involved with the farmer's market. So the first question uh, I'd love for each to answer is, what's the number one resource in the last year that you've used to navigate and, and really move the, your process, whatever it was, forward in the legislature. Could be a website, could be a resource, could be a lobbyist, but you know, what's that number one resource that's made you successful? And then uh, the, the mo more exciting question is, um, do you really believe that the environment here and the state legislature um, uh, in Colorado, uh, do you think it's better uh, to approach it with a proceed until apprehended or act first and ask second? Or do you think the collaboration and being uh, an acting partner in government um, can advance your issue faster, black or white? Two. Okay, so our number one resource, um, amazing regional experts. And I'll just add a caveat to that. We are, in an, we are in an awesome position in which we have the resources to hire the best people in the state to help us navigate that system. So I think there's still a role in government in, in saying, um, what can we do to make that process more open and easier to navigate for those, those companies, those startups that aren't as big as a Lyft or Uber um, that, can, that has the resources to do that. Um, and then the second question. Proceed into apprehended or ask and collaborate? Uh, find those champions early and hang on to them. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty well said. Um, I mean, our strongest asset is positively our rider base and the drivers. Um, you know, Uber doesn't work unless drivers are making money and riders can rely on rides. That's why we're growing so rapidly. Um, and so that's just straight up. That's our greatest strength. Um, as for proceed um, until apprehended, we weren't doing anything wrong in the first place. It's innovation, and um, you got to be marching with that drumbeat of innovation. Uh, I think the greatest resource that I've used over the last year, um, and even before then, with with uh, regular uh, reference to, is a book uh, by Dale Carnegie, written in 1925, I believe, and it's as true then as it is now. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, and then uh, I think the answer to that is both. I think you should, you know, uh, ask for uh, forgiveness a lot, um, and to the degree that you can collaborate, um, but still innovate and succeed, you should. Thank you very much. Let's give a huge round of applause to Veronica, Will, and Representative Pabone. Um, really fun panel today. They're going to stick around and answer a few more of your questions casually. Um, I really encourage you to attend more leadership spotlights throughout the week. Base camp is yours. Um, as we said this morning, for those of you here at the breakfast, this uh, program is not possible without your involvement. So it's truly for the community, by the community, for the future startup community in Denver. And so the more you participate, the easier these things become. And we can't thank you enough for being here today. And uh, thank you again for being on the panel. Cheers. Thank you.